Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 2.2. Now, if you remember, what we did in 2.1 was we talked about this one level device and did a simple, what you might call a semi classical treatment. That is, equations like this that we discussed in Module 1. These are often called rate equations. It tells you the rate at which the number of electrons changes in terms of some simple arguments here. Okay? Now, what, as I explained then, that this was sort of like a backdrop for doing the quantum calculation. That is, to see how one should modify the Schrodinger equation to include the contacts. Now, for Schrodinger equation, we have to start from, as we said, there is this time independent one and the time dependent one. And for this discussion, we want to start from the time dependent one. And since we are doing a one level device, of course, the h is just a number, this epsilon psi. And when you connect the contacts, you expect to have kind of two terms. Judging from what we had seen before, that there would be a term that would be proportional to the number of electrons, and then there would be a term that would be like a source term that tells you what comes in from the contacts. So there would be these two types of things you expect. So let's first think of this second term, the one that depends on n. In the quantum context, when we do the Schrodinger equation, of course, Equivalent thing would be to add here a term that depends on psi. So I'll call that sigma, say. So you might say, well, that doesn't look like you did much. I mean, there was an epsilon times psi and you have added a sigma. But there is an important difference. That is, this epsilon is always real. It's this energy level. When you talk of matrices, the equivalent thing is eps uh, the Hamiltonian is always Hermitian. Its eigenvalues are real. So this is real, whereas this sigma is complex. And so what you'll see is in the matrix case, what we are adding is not Hermitian anymore necessarily, but can have non-Hermitian parts. Okay. So we are adding the sigma to it here. And what we'd like to do is get an expression for dn dt. And for dn dt then, the way you get it from the quantum viewpoint would be that suppose these things would, this is for psi, whereas if you want dn dt, what you need is something like d dt of psi times psi star. You see, because psi is this wave function whose square kind of tells you where the electron is. So the psi psi star, that would give you a measure of this dn dt. So this is the quantity that we want to evaluate. And as you know, if you use the chain rule, this would give you two terms, ih bar d psi dt times psi star, and there will be a psi times ih bar d psi star dt. Okay. So I've just done this chain rule. And next thing that we'll do is, replace this with what we have from the Schrodinger equation. So this is where you'll have an epsilon plus sigma times psi. And when you look at this quantity here, this is where you want the IH bar d psi dt complex conjugate. Now that also would be something like this, except that when we take the complex conjugate, for the i we pick up a minus i. And so, i h bar d psi star dt will have a minus epsilon plus sigma star. Of course, epsilon I'm not taking the complex conjugate because that's real, but as I said, the sigma in general is complex, so I'll keep the sigma star, and then there'll be a psi star. So now if you collect these things together, what you get you'll see is epsilon plus sigma minus epsilon minus sigma star times psi psi star. Okay. 
And if you are interpreting this psi psi star as n, then you see what we have got is i h bar d n d t. So I could write n here, d n d t is equal to, take this off, is equal to, see the epsilon cancels out, what you have is sigma minus sigma star times n. That's it, see? So, you could take the ih bar from here and put it over there. So, this is what you get then from the Schrodinger equation if you just add a this complex term there, okay? Now, compare it with what we had written down for the simple rate equation, if you remember, that dn dt is equal to, there was a source term, which we have not yet considered, but if we just look at the other term, you know, there was this s minus nu times n, and the source term we have not considered yet. So if you look at the two, you can see how you can get a correspondence between them. This quantity here should be, should play the role of this escape rate. So in the semi-classical picture, what was an escape rate new would be, in this picture would be played by sigma minus sigma star. That's this thing with the dimensions of energy. You're taking its kind of imaginary part, dividing it by h bar. So what you could do is, let me write this in a slightly different way. I'll put a minus i times sigma minus, I'm sorry, minus here, minus sigma star divided by h bar times n. That's it. So this is the quantity then that really is like new that escape rate that I had introduced in the simple, the semi-classical picture of module one. So based on that then, we could write, I guess, I could collect this result here. I could say I times sigma minus sigma star is equal to h bar nu. And that is the quantity which I'll generally future right as a gamma. So this was, has the dimensions of per second. When you multiply it by Planck's constant, actually divided by two pi, but that's joule second. So that together it has the energy of, it has the dimensions of energy, which could be joules or electron volts. And that's what we'll write as gamma. And that then is like the, like the twice this imaginary part of the sigma, the negative imaginary part. So that's then the first point that I wanted to clear on. Now, now let's talk about the source term a little bit, meaning the term that is independent of n. So what you have done so far then is, I've added the sigma here. So there was this epsilon psi, now we have added this part which is complex, and then what we now want to do is add a source term S. And if you do that, you'll get psi is equal to S divided by E minus epsilon minus sigma. Now, the sigma you could write, sigma here, you could write as, uh, there's a real part to it and an imaginary part. Right? So I could write it as sigma r minus i gamma over 2. So this is something you can check out that if I put this quantity here, this, this is the real part, and then there is an imaginary part. If we put that in here, it would be i times sigma minus sigma star would be gamma, okay? So you could write it this way. And that then gives you psi is equal to s 
divided by E minus epsilon minus sigma r plus I gamma over 2. So, one thing I should mention here is that, you know, when we did the semi-classical picture, if you remember, there was a one, everything had a one component and a two component, and the sum is what I'm writing without any subscripts. And the same here, that when I write something like this, when I write sigma, there's like a sigma one and a sigma two, one due to contact one, one due to contact two. And when I just write just sigma, what I mean is the sum of the two. Similarly, source term, for the moment, let's say we are just talking about the source term in contact one. So this is really just S1, let's say. So this is really just S1. So now, and what we obtained is, if electrons were coming in from contact one, then what would be the wave function inside, inside the channel? And this, if you done did psi star psi, would tell you the number of electrons in the channel. Now, what I'd, the important result I wanted to get across after this is that just as in the previous case, we had argued that the source term must be escape rate times F1. Similarly, there is an equivalent relationship for in the, in the quantum case, namely, in what we had for this capital S1, which was like the like a real number in the rate equation picture, now we have this complex quantity, and what you can show is S1 times S1 star should be equal to, see, will be equal to this gamma 1 times F1. Now, gamma 1, of course, is kind of like proportional to this new one, because this is per second, h bar new one is like gamma one, times f one, that's fine. And only extra thing no, that doesn't quite follow from here or by analogy is that it's divided by two pi. Okay. But otherwise, this is it. Similarly, if you were writing s two, it would be gamma two f two divided by two pi. So there is this simple relationship between the nu1, nu2, or this gamma1, gamma2, which describe how easily electrons leak out into the contact, and these are related to the source terms, that is how easily electrons come in from the contact. So there is this connection between the two. So once you have fixed one, it kind of fixes the other. Of course, if you were starting from Schrodinger equation and obtaining all these gammas by putting boundary conditions and this sources you know, directly, then it should automatically satisfy this relation. But it's good to know that there is a relation like this, which you know any proper treatment has to satisfy, because otherwise the equilibrium conditions would not have come out correctly. Now, how would you show this? Well, the way it would work is something like, we had an expression for psi before. So from psi, you can calculate psi psi star, so you could calculate the psi psi star, which would then look like S1, S1 star, divided by the magnitude of this squared. So this would be like E minus epsilon minus sigma r squared plus gamma over two square. So, the denominator is complex, like A plus IB. So when I take it, multiply it by its complex conjugate, I get A square plus B square. So this would be the psi psi star. And if you want to find the total number of electrons, you kind of have to integrate over energy. Because all of this is for a specific energy E, and you have to integrate here. And what you can show is that when you integrate this, this quantity can actually be integrated analytically. And so finally what you get is this 2 pi over gamma. So 2 pi S1, S1 star 
over gamma. So that's the kind of the number you'd get by integrating this. And that is the quantity that must, you could argue, should match what we had argued earlier from this semi-classical picture. And by equating that, you'd get this relation that I wrote down. And uh, the details, I'm not going over this last part because it's all in the notes anyway. You can just look it up. Okay. Now, the main message though here that I wanted to get across is that just as in the semi-classical picture, you can add a escape rate and a source term. Similarly, in the Schrodinger equation, the quantum version, you can add this, what people often call it the self-energy although the origin of the name won't be obvious why they do that, but that sigma is called the self-energy. And then there's a source term. And here I did it for a one-level system. This whole same idea carries over for matrices as well, which is what I'll talk about in the uh, next module. But you can do that and there will be a source term. And there are very similar relationships. But the one important point that I wanted to stress is that here you'll notice I put just S1 and I did not include S2, for example. Because in general, of course, you'll have source, source, you'd have electrons coming in from both sides. You see, from both contacts. So you could have included an S1 plus S2. And this would be wrong. In this case, you see in the semi-classical case, you can just, I, I had both S1 and S2, there was no problem. But in the quantum case, if you do that, then when you calculate psi psi star, you'll get something like S1 plus S2 times S1 star plus S2 star. And when you do that, you'll end up with four terms. You know, two of these are positive, whereas the other two are complex quantities with phase factors in them, you see. Now the point is, this is the important subtle point, and that is that in practice when you look, in experiments, no one ever sees these cross terms. And this is where, see, if you want to use an analogy with light, you'd say something like this, that when you take two light bulbs, you know, electro, you have this light which is like electromagnetic waves, and electromagnetic waves are described by electric fields. The thing is, if you add the two sources, ordinarily what you'd add is the power, and the power is proportional to the electric field squared. You don't add electric fields. So it's a 40 watt light bulb and a 40 watt together is 80 watts. You add powers, but not the electric fields themselves. On the other hand, there are laser sources, which are coherent sources, where you actually add the electric fields. Now with electrons, again, psi psi star, that's more like power, that's the number. This is a positive quantity. On the other hand, the psi is more like the electric field. But the difference is that in the case of electrons, there isn't quite anything like the lasers. When we are, as long as we are talking of normal electrons in normal conductors, there's really not, no equivalent of the laser. And so, it's always like the thermal light sources. You have to add the psi psi stars. And that is why when analyzing devices, it is, it is not convenient to actually start from the Schrodinger equation, but people start from a, from a, another version which actually involves the psi psi stars directly. Because then you see when you have multiple sources, you can just add them up. So that is what we'll do in the next module, in a, including the matrices.